Good morning, it's Sunday morning and we're out in Old Town at the end of Renton Road at the Hawaiian Railway Society. And we're going to go for a train ride uh, this afternoon. Train, uh, 12.30 train is just about ready to load. Uh, behind me you'll see EVA 1, it's uh, one of our old steam engines. Unfortunately we're not going to use that today, it's uh, awaiting restoration. But we do have a nice shiny diesel and uh, five cars. We'll be going from uh, EVA down to Kahi Point. It takes about an hour and a half. My name is Dave Mueller. I'm the treasurer of the society, also a volunteer out here on Sunday. And we'd like to welcome you aboard our Sunday train rides. Is everybody ready? All aboard! The Hawaiian Railway Society is an educational nonprofit organization with a twofold mission. First, to save, restore, and protect the historic railway equipment that has survived since 1889. Secondly, to educate people about the rich history of railroading in the islands. The Society maintains about six and a half miles of track upon which it operates the only active railroad on Oahu. In the late 1980s, the Society began giving regularly scheduled Sunday rides. And in 1992, they added weekday rides for chartered groups. Today the Society remains a club of rail enthusiasts who volunteer their weekends and holidays to restore and maintain the historic right-of-way and some of the old railroad equipment in Hawaii. Two 1944 locomotives, number 302 and number 423, have been restored to operating status and take turns pulling the passenger train. One of the volunteers instrumental in making this all happen is Dick Marshall. So basically, the, the train is run by electricity. Yeah, yeah. What they call diesel electric. Very efficient setup. Fuel moving parts that way. And so, how old is this? This, uh... this engine is about 50 years old. A little, little old, about 53 years old. Manufactured in 1944. It's a war engine made for the Army, I mean the Navy, up in uh, Lolo Lake. They use it to transport uh, projectiles, explosives, and Pearl Harbor. And when was it restored? Uh, we just, as a matter of fact, just finished it, just now getting it ready for, for line service. We're having a little trouble with overheating on this front engine, but uh, we think we can get that. We just recently changed all the injectors on the back engine because it was smoking excessively, so we, uh, we changed that and got that all finished, so that's working good now. Now, uh, I know there's a name on, on this engine. Whose name is on this engine? I was surprised when they did that. I really did not expect that. It uh, came right out of the blue. And, uh, quite an honor, really. I don't know who was behind it, but apparently from what the award said, it was unanimously voted for. It's quite a compliment. Yeah, it is, really. Yeah. There are not many people that are fortunate enough to have something like that happen in their lifetime, but I have to be one of them that did. 
I understand there's three generations of marshals that are involved with uh, the railroad museum? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's myself, my son, and my grandson. Uh, one right after the other. There's always going to be a marshal there. Hang in there. <laughs> On Saturdays, volunteers work to maintain and restore Oahu's railway history. In, in this area. In this. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Hi, my name is Peter Dillingham, and I'm one of the grandsons of Benjamin Franklin Dillingham. And he was the founder of the Wahoo Railroad and Land Company. One day, he contacted James Campbell in conversation with him, and James Campbell owned 60,000 acres on Oahu, I believe all the way up to Pearl City. And he told Mr. Campbell that if he had owned the property, or succession for him to do, was that to build a railroad around his property and then subdivide the property in lots so that the people could then use a railroad to go back and forth to Honolulu. Well, so a few days later, Mr. Campbell came back and offered the, the property at $600,000. In those days, $600,000 was very, very expensive. And so he was not able to finance that. So what happened after a few more meetings, uh, he leased the property from Mr. Campbell, uh, whereupon his investment new enterprise was two-pronged. One was to do as much as he could to develop the property and also to build a railroad so that the landowners could use that railroad to go back and forth to Honolulu. Uh, from that time on, he started putting his full attention onto forming a railroad and to call it the Oahu Railway and Land Company. My name is Fred Trotter, and I'm the great-grandson of James Campbell. Mr. Campbell was a part of the history of Hawaii, having bought these lands of Honoluli back in the 1870s. I believe that when they went to public auction and he purchased them, that Ben Dillingham was one of the other bidders for this particular property. My great-grandfather was able to purchase the land. He and Ben Dillingham were contemporaries. And when Mr. Dillingham proposed the Oahu Railroad and Land Company, I believe my grand great-grandfather uh, invested and made it possible for Mr. Dillingham to build the railroad. After it was built, and stories are told in the family that Mr. Dillingham offered him some stock in the company, which Mr. Campbell politely declined. He seemed to have had an unwritten rule not to invest in other people's companies. He was a very independent man and lived his life concerning himself with his family and his holdings. The railroad was very important in those days because it brought the goods and supplies to the plantations. 
and it brought the plantation's product back to town. Prior to the railroad, all of that was done by small lighters offshore to uh, bigger boats and sugar was carried in bags. My great-grandfather was involved in the starting of Eba Plantation where we're filming this picture, Oahu Sugar Company and Kuuku Plantation. Interestingly, they all started in the same year, 1890. And it was during those early years <clears throat> that uh, James B. Castle, uh, B.F. Dillingham, and some of the other uh, people got together to lease the land from Mr. Campbell and start these plantations. Um, Wild Sugar Company lasting from 1890 to 1996. All three companies are closed today um, and while I consider it a very unhappy event, <coughs> I know that change takes place. But when you consider the magnificent job that these plantations did with this land for well over a hundred years, it'll be a long time before anybody else comes along and puts it to as good a productive use. A train was a very, very important part of life at that time as it made transportation much simpler. There were limited roads in those days. The railroad could travel at a, at a pretty good clip and <clears throat> lots of commerce was created, jobs created. Because of this railroad and what it brought uh, to the plantations and the community, Mr. Campbell was always a strong supporter of, of the railroad company. In his day, he was involved in starting a lot of different entities, none of which he owned stock in, but he simply invested. The Campbell estate had been very supportive of the Hawaii Railway Society. Uh, they continued to support them by helping them with this property, providing them some easements through their lands, supporting them economically and other ways. And I just wish that other, other businesses would support the Railway Society so it'll be here for a long time to come. Again, any of you that watch this, I hope you'll join me in um, supporting the Railway Society any way you can. And it would be your legacy to the history of Hawaii to be able to contribute money, time, effort, uh, old-fashioned stories like I'm trying to tell. Well, most of the history of Hawaii lies in the minds of people and not on the pages of books. Bill Patey was instrumental in helping the society save historical equipment from the welder's torch. Hey guys, I want to tell you something, you know, when I was your age, on the plantation, they had all a lot of locomotives, about a half a dozen, they were going all over the place. 
That's how they took the sugar cane. They took the sugar cane from the fields. They put it in that cane cart back that, there, like that. that see, green see, the, see, see the they cane? Got, they that, got green stuff. Yeah, that green one. Yeah. They put all the cane inside there. Truck they took it down. Food. Took it. They took it down the mill. They had a special track uh, railroad line. They took it in the mill, and they took that whole cane car and they dumped it. It's like you're dumping trash. They dumped it right inside the mill. And they go back down, and then the locomotive would take it and pull them back out to the field, the empties. Fill them up again and bring them back down to the mill. It was crazy the way they did that. They'd look, and so you heard that whistle like this all day long. The locomotive was going, whoo, 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 whoo. So, but not like today now, but these were all part of the way they worked in the sugar plantation in those days. And uh, so I hope you remember that because it was a great time. Yes, indeed. Good. How about that, Casey, huh? You like to be a locomotive engineer? <laughs> Over Lulu Lay, where were we? 1975. 75, yeah, yes. about that time. I, you that's know. when I joined up, 1975. 1975, okay. Right. Well, that was, that was uh, a great year for sugar. I tell you, the sugar price was up and uh, <laughs> uh, everybody's feeling good, but that's when they started this thing. And so, you, you know, you're talking uh, 20, almost 30 years uh, going on that these people have been at it. So, uh, it's a dedication of all these people. He, you know, he's not making any real money out of this thing. He just comes in there and does what he can, uh, but he does it because it's railroading is in his blood, if I can say that, and uh, and, and he knows how to do it. So we're real lucky, uh, the railroading society, to have these kinds of people because you can always get people to take tickets and get people to kind of uh, watch out for things. But when it comes to repair work and it comes to the kind of work that you're doing here. Uh, you got to have a pro, and this is where guys like Bob come in. So, well, hello, Bob, for a job Appreciate well done. Yeah, yeah. Part of preserving the history of Hawaii. That's right, yeah, and it goes on and on. But if we don't work at it, we don't stay with it, don't bring the kids out, we're going to lose it. And that's those youngsters we saw here earlier are what it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way to pass the history on. Because the parents are too busy, too lazy watching TV, but they'll come, they remember, they get the ride, they go home and say, hey, you know what I did today? I went on a train ride. And they may go on a train ride in the mainland someday, but probably, very likely, this will be the only train ride that they'll have for, a long, for years to come. So we're lucky to have it. In 1899, Ben Dillingham realized a long-time dream, that of building a fine hotel in Haleiwa. Herman Lemke, whose father photographed the hotel, remembers. The North Shore in 1900 was practically out of reach as far as the people in Honolulu were concerned because there were very few roads and whatever roads existed were muddy and not dependable. So when Ben Dillingham came along with the concept of having people taken from Alapak all the way out to the North Shore was really a great concept. And everybody that could afford the trip was extremely happy. To get to this fantastic hotel that was built in 1900, uh, the train took about two hours from Honolulu and the cost was a mere two dollars round trip. The, to stay at the hotel the cost was about three dollars single per night and four and a half dollars for a couple which sounds very reasonable 
as far as today's prices are concerned. But in those days, that was a good price. The tourists that came to Honolulu in 1900 with the building of the Alamo, Ala, the Moana Hotel was a great chance for them to get out of town and have this beautiful ride past Pearl Harbor, the Duck Ponds, Eva, and finally to the North Shore where you could have dinner and stay for a couple of nights and return back to Honolulu. The train itself was put together by Dillingham practically uh, by himself. Uh, he had very little help from Honolulu other than that a few financiers did help him with his so-called Dillingham's Folly which was supposed to be something that would not last. But between taking care of the problems of the sugarcane industry on the North Shore all the way through Waipaho and into town, carrying the sugar uh, to the uh, port of call of Honolulu, was extremely helpful because otherwise to do it by trucks was almost impossible. In fact, Dillingham ran his train not only to Kahuku, but he ran it up Waikili Valley up to Wahiwa, where he is responsible for carrying all the freight and sand from Waimea Bay up to uh, Waipaho so that they could build Schofield. Without this train, Schofield would have never been built. As far as the people that visited it, uh, the Wailu Hotel, it was extremely interesting because here they had a chance to get to the North Shore to see something that they could not see in Waikiki or in any other part of the world. And so, you have a, a facility that was extremely important to the uh, tourist industry that existed at that time and was just starting. So this was a big, big help. In 1900, Ben Dillingham asked his master car builder to design and build a special car just for him and his family. The result was the parlor car slash observation car number 64, which was built by the ORNL in Honolulu. David Lomas, a lifelong member of the society, spent eight years almost single-handedly restoring the parlor car. 
The work was completed in 1994 and the car is available for private charter. The car is also put on the train on the second Sunday of each month so that the general public may view it or even ride in it. One of the items that the society wanted to restore was this coach here. This is coach 64. Coach 64 was built in 1900 for Ben Dilligan. Ben was the owner of the railroad at the time and this was his own private coach. He had on board um, many uh, uh, notable people, one of which was uh, Queen Lily Okalani actually rode on this coach. Um, it was used on the railroad until it closed down in 1947. After that, it was stored for a few years and then it was put on display at Ala Moana Center for a couple of years. Um, it left Ala Moana Center when they did the phase two and it was moved to Bishop Museum. It stayed at Bishop Museum for a number of years and then finally um, came here to the Hawaiian Railroad Society. Um, I got involved in, in restoring this coach back in, I think it was 1984. Um, and I've been, uh, with a lot of help of course, uh, we, restored, we restored the coach. Um, when it originally came to the Hawaiian Railway Society from the Bishop Museum, it was in pretty poor condition. There was uh, a lot of the front was, was rotted away. Um, there was very little of the roof left. And the inside needed a lot of work. The inside, the termites had, um, had really made a meal of the inside of the coach. So it took eight years to restore it. And it, the coach finally ran on the railroad again in uh, 1994 and uh, we had a blessing for it and it was a very it was a great occasion everybody enjoyed it and the coach now runs regularly up and down the tracks and it's doing fine I'd like to invite um, everybody to come down here and see this coach as well as um, everything else down here at the Hawaiian Railway Society um, both young and old would really be interested in, in seeing the stuff down here this coach um, the older folks will probably remember it running on the railroad and I'm sure the young people have never seen anything like this. This is a very unique coach in that it has such a long lanai at one end. Um, you can ride on this coach for a little extra cost and if you have a really special function you can actually hire the whole coach for, for your um, wedding or whatever um, special occasion you have. So please contact the Hawaiian Railway Society and come down and see the coach. Thank you. Coach 64 was built entirely of wood. Passengers rode in comfort in leather armchairs. The car included a galley and a small lavatory, complete with a marble top sink. It was used often by the ORNL to host visiting dignitaries and could be rented by others for private travel. The observation platform offered guests a chance to enjoy the cool trade winds as well as giving them a better view of the passing landscape. It all began with a vision of a young man named Benjamin Franklin Dillingham. For nearly 60 years, the Oahu Railway and Land Company was the backbone of transportation on Oahu. Its 70-mile main line connected Honolulu with Pearl Harbor, the Leeward Coast, and the North Shore on its route to Kahuku. In 1947, the ORNL abandoned the main line. It continued limited operation between the pineapple canneries and the docks in Honolulu until 1971 before final abandonment. Many of the locomotives and train cars were either sold off or scrapped. Most of the track around the island was torn up. Hawaii might have lost this valuable page of history except for a group of rail enthusiasts who formed the Hawaii Railway Society in 1970. Today, there is an open air museum with historic locomotives and train cars on display. Visitors are welcome to walk around the train yard 
to see what has been restored and what still needs work on. The Hawaiian Railway Society, with the help of dedicated volunteers and generous patrons, continues its quest to preserve and restore Oahu's railway pass.